Ladies and gentlemen, we are pleased to welcome you within the unique festival, Different Ever After. The festival offers a great place to discuss how differently and amazingly our society and planet are changing and which role we play in the big game. Уважаемые зрители, дамы и господа, все, кто присоединился к нашей трансляции, добрый день. Вы знаете, что с 22 октября по 28 октября, сегодня уже шестой день фестиваля, посольство Великобритании в Москве и ведущая российская просветительская медиа теории и практики проводят действительно уникальный онлайн-фестиваль о Великобритании «Different Ever After». Двадцатый год повлиял на жизни многих людей и общества в целом. Так вот, данный фестиваль как раз о том, как меняется мир вокруг нас. И главное, это фестиваль о важном, о том, что нас ждет впереди. Итак, совсем скоро начнется очень интересная, увлекательная дискуссия. В целом сегодня весь день супер интересный, насыщенный. И поэтому до практики перейдем к небольшой теории для тех, кто присоединился к нам только первый раз. Технические моменты. Сегодня дискуссия пройдет на английском языке. Поэтому, если вам необходимо для более глубокого осознавания этой информации перейти на русский перевод, если вы смотрите нас с компьютера, то, пожалуйста, вы можете включить перевод. Для этого надо на нижней панели нажать на изображение глобуса и выбрать нужный э, язык, соответственно, русский. Если вы нас смотрите со своего гаджета и смартфона, то тогда на нижней панели надо будет нажать три точки и в появившемся списке нажать на пункт «Перевод». И, конечно, сегодня мы хотим перейти уже к той дискуссии, которая более чем актуальна. Поэтому с радостью для меня огромная честь представить модератора нашей дискуссии. Я передаю слово научному обозревателю сайта Тайга Инфо Илье Кабанову. И до того, как Илья начнет вещание, Илья, я знаю, что у нас появляется огромное количество вопросов во время дискуссии. Поэтому буквально такое последнее объявление от меня. Если вы хотите задать вопрос спикеру, то вам необходимо написать вопросы и ответы. После прохождения модерации мы уже передадим их спикерам. Еще раз большое спасибо за внимание. Илья Кабанов, Илья, вам слово. Thank you, Константин. Hello, everyone. Welcome to our session. And since it's a virtual event, I can't actually see you, but I still appreciate you joining us. It's an honor to be among moderators of the Different Ever After Festival. This is my third festival event, and every time I learn something new. And today we will learn about innovation in action and how to adapt to a pandemic. In April 2020, Innovate UK launched a 40 million pounds grant program to support innovative projects that could help to mitigate the coronavirus outbreak. And thanks to this program, hundreds of projects from different fields have been launched. We will discuss four of these projects today. And let me just give you a taste of what awaits us. A virtual platform for watching live performances without leaving your home. A virtual farmer's market that allows you to get quality products without any threat to health. Portable device for complex clinical examination and remote patient diagnosis online platform for child development and parental support during the pandemic. We will see how innovative solutions work in practice, what drives business innovation forward and how they can help make a difference during these interesting times. We will have five minutes presentation from each of our speakers and then we will switch to Q&A session. And I encourage all of you to submit your questions. We're looking forward to it. And now it's time to introduce our wonderful speakers for today's session. Dr. Steven Katebe, who is co-founder and director of Techie Health Solution. He is also practicing GP in the Lake District, so he has a deep understanding of the doctor-patient relationship. Dr. Katebe is a member of the American Telemedicine Association. Emma Selby is an award-winning clinical nurse consultant specializing in children and young adults' mental health and also in women's health. In 2018, Emma established Digital Mentality. With her collaborators, she created Embers the Dragon, a digital platform that can empower families and support children to improve their mental health. Next is Toby Coffey, who is the head of digital development in the National Theatre in London. 
He established the Immersive Storytelling Studio to examine how virtual reality and other emerging technologies can enable an audience to stand in the shoes of another. Its work has been shown around the world, including premieres at Sundance Film Festival and the Venice International Film Festival. Also with us today is Julie Cummins, accountant by training and farmer by choice. She lives in Scotland, still has a small accountancy practice, but now run the largest goat meat herd in Scotland with around 300 goats. Last year, her farm was nominated for the famous Golden Fork Award. And also with us is Dr. Neil Morgan, Senior Innovation Lead at the Innovate UK. He has been responsible for several high profile programs for the agency. Most recently, a rapid response for the COVID-19 crisis. The program received more than 8,000 applications in two weeks. And I think we should start with Neil. Hello, Neil. Thanks for joining us. Please tell us more about the Innovate UK mission and its recent program. Thank you, Ilya. Um, my name is Neil Morgan. I work at the UK government's agency for innovation, Innovate UK where we focus on funding innovative new products and services in UK industry. We're actually part of a wider organization called UK Research and Innovation. You'll see on my slides in a moment that we have UKRI as our logo, logo that's UK Research and Innovation, um, which includes a number of research councils focused on funding the UK research base, including universities. My background before Innovate UK is actually in the medical device industry, and I spent some 20 years working particularly on cardiovascular medical devices in the UK and the US before joining Innovate UK. So I'm now going to share my slides. I presume those are sharing now, if not, somebody will tell me. Um, so the program that Ilya briefly mentioned uh, that I'm responsible for at the moment is, is known as the business-led innovation in response to global disruption. And that's where uh, the four projects you're gonna hear today uh, receive their funding. So just to take you back a little bit for, for those who, who don't know the situation in the UK, but in, on, on the 24th of March this year, uh, the UK was locked down officially locked down. That meant we were no longer able to even travel to our workplaces. Children, including my own, were no longer able to, to, to attend school. Um, all travel was um, stopped apart from essential travel from what we call key workers, hospital workers, etc., and some education workers. COVID-19 deaths were increasing exponentially in the UK and other countries and other countries and all over the world, we were going into states of emergency. The UK was experiencing the acute effects of COVID-19. There was massive stress on healthcare and delivery, food supply, manufacturing supply chains. We faced months out of work in, and education, or at least from our work and education places, we were able to, to work online, of course. Um, businesses were closing down and there was unprecedented disruption to everyday lives and the UK economy. So UK research innovation quickly recognized the wider impact the disease would have on UK businesses. And we implemented a range of measures to support innovative UK companies developing solutions to the current challenges. And I'm gonna focus on, on one of them today. So um, we received a budget of some 40 million UK sterling pounds, which I believe is some 4 billion rubles, specifically in this program for UK businesses um, and, and focused around the health impact. So the direct impact of the virus itself in terms of death and serious illness, but also other things. So the economic recovery, we have to look to the future. The UK and the world is teetering on the edge of an extended depression and innovation is needed now more than ever to build a more resilient and sustainable economy. 
almost overnight the way we work and play has been revolutionized companies have had to quickly adapt to online working jobs have been lost and won you wake up and the house is on fire you gotta make a decision i'm gonna say much there's a bit of background there, noise there, and the need to operate efficiently yet remotely from the traditional office or shop floor has been forced upon us at an extraordinary pace. Business models and revenue generation is changing. Again, an unprecedented need, but also opportunity for UK businesses, we think, to develop radically new business models and revenue streams. And again, you'll hear from some projects that are doing that today. Um, and where we live matters, over half of the UK's population and approximately 60% actually of our gross domestic product, our GTP, is concentrated in our cities. And nowhere have the broad effects of COVID-19 COVID lockdown and changes in the way we live been felt more acutely than in our cities. So this programme, this um, business-led innovation in response to global disruption programme, as we called it, the opportunity is for UK businesses to receive a grant in advance, 100% funding of 50,000 UK sterling pounds, or I believe 5 million rubles, for clearly innovative and ambitious ideas, which would realistically and significantly meet a societal need that has emerged or increased due to the COVID-19 pandemic, or the need of an industry that has been severely impacted or permanently disrupted. So as I said, we were locked down on the 24th of March. We actually opened the program. We moved very rapidly. People were working weekends and quite honestly, almost 24 hours a day, some people to get this competition open quickly and to provide this money in advance. So we opened on the 30th of March and seven days to go until closing. We had a few hundred applications, 24 hours to go. We had over 1500 applications. And at 6 a.m. on the day of closing the competition, we had 4,000 applications. And then when we closed just six hours later, we had over 8,500 UK businesses applying to us for this 50,000 UK sterling pounds grant for their innovation, to develop their innovation. Obviously, with that budget, we were unable to fund them all. All those applications go out for external peer review and assessment um so we carried out that assessment and then we have been able to fund what we regard as the most promising innovations through that through this program so in the end with our budget our 40 million uk pounds we were able to fund 865 projects and they cover a whole range of areas so Going through these little logos, we have 59 projects in the area of personal protection equipment. That includes face masks, um, but other clothing as well for personal protection. Uh, we have 30 projects that are focused on mental, mental wealth, 22 that are focused on social distancing um, to stop the spread of the, of the virus, 24 that are focused actually on legal services and financial services, 75 that are focused on the workplace, 47 projects, 47 companies working on education uh, and new business models and ways of delivering education from actually children, small children, right up to postgraduate level. We have fashion, we have childcare, disabilities, construction, medicine and healthcare delivery. We have baking, we have virtual museums, transport, we have sports, we have cinema, food and drink, dentistry, hairdressing, shopping centers and shopping trolleys and sanitization around shops. We have music, streaming and music festivals, and we have theater, and you'll hear from some of these. And my final slide before handing on is just a little bit more of a breakdown of where we have these 865 projects. So we have things in social care, elderly supports, antibody testing, viral testing, digital passports, as we call them, education across the board, as I've mentioned, artificial intelligence, modeling of health, hand washing, antimicrobial resistance, um, personal protection equipment, including filters, as well as face masks and other things. Um, we have remote care and managing the backlog uh, of, um, 
operations and, and medical procedures in the, in the hospitals. Um, we have sector recovery, so that's industry sectors, food and manufacturing, live entertainment, virtual visiting. Um, we have mental health, as I've said, and we have workplace resilience, including manual labor and clerical, clerical labor. So I will hand on now. Is it back to you, Ilya? Yes, yes, thank you. Uh, thank you, Neil, for starting our discussion. I'm sure our viewers will have a lot of questions for you. Uh, our next guest is Dr. Steven Katebe. Hello, Steven. It's great to have you. And since it's virtually impossible to see a doctor in Russia these days, I will list uh, my symptoms to you after our discussion in hope uh, of getting some diagnosis. Now, floor is yours. Indeed. Thank you. Thank you very much, Leo. Dobry uh, din, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Stephen Katebi. I'm going to start sharing my, my screen now. Okay, so. Okay, so first of all, it is an honor and a privilege to speak to you today about the work that we've been doing in healthcare during this pandemic. <clears throat> So I am a family uh, doctor, and I'm also one of the co-founders of a company called Techie Health Solutions. So Techie Health is a medical technology company. So we use state-of-the-art technologies to help clinicians provide medical services remotely to their patients. The device that we, um, we use or utilize is called the Techie Hub. Um, and as I mentioned, it allows clinicians to not only see their patients from afar, but we can also examine them, which is very uh, important, particularly when it comes to COVID-19. Now, over the past um, several months, we have witnessed the devastating impact that COVID-19 has had on our lives. Many of us have lost loved ones, and so many of us um, have witnessed the impact on our livelihoods and our economies. Millions of people have been infected around the world and so many have died. The pandemic has had a devastating impact on a section of our society that is particularly vulnerable. People who live in care homes or nursing homes uh, and assisted living are particularly vulnerable. They're often frail, uh, they have complex medical problems, um, and they're elderly. Around the world, we've seen horror stories of patients who have died uh, in these institutions due to COVID-19. Um, as you can see on this chart, in the US, more than 40% of COVID deaths have occurred in elderly care facilities. In France, it's almost 50%, and in the UK, the numbers are very similar to the US. Unfortunately, Russia has not escaped uh, the impact either. Uh, it's estimated that there are about 280,000 uh, nursing homes in Russia, and many of these have been impacted by the disease. So, our company um, has a device called the Techie Hub Pro. It is a comprehensive set of medical devices that can be used to provide remote medical care. This is ideal for care and nursing homes. By reducing the number of face-to-face -face contacts, that is people uh, going in and out of these care homes, we can reduce the spread of infections such as COVID-19. The additional benefit is we can also reduce the need for PPE and it minimizes the impact on the clinical staff. Uh, in other words, they, they, few of them end up catching infections, um, uh, which is again, important uh, in the fight this condition. So the Techie Hub consists of a modular uh, diagnostic suite. So this is the uh, picture at the bottom here. Um, which allows the doctor 
to listen to the patient's chest. They can look into their ears. They can look into their throat. They can examine their skin. We can measure uh, blood pressure. We can look at the oxygen levels in their blood. We can get heart tracing and also uh, an idea of the patient's lung functions. All of this in this comprehensive suite. So um, this is a, an example of the actual stethoscope. So this is the uh, a device which we use to place in the patient's chest. Again, it has a high definition camera, so we can look at um, skin rashes, moles, etc. Um, we can look into the patient's ear. Uh, we have a device which allows the, the, us to do um, a heart tracing, it's called an ECG. And the device which enables us to perform lung function analysis. At the clinician end, all they have in front of them is their PC or their laptop, and they have a web link. So they can actually control all of those devices um, from their laptop or desktop. Rather than actually talk about what I would like to do now is actually play you a video um, demonstrating uh, how this device actually works in real life.
Excellent. So um, hopefully you've um, got an idea of exactly what um, this uh, device can actually do. Um, I want to point out around the world, we have seen a number of um, medical technology companies who are offering what is essentially telemedicine. So it's the ability for the doctor to see the patient, but most of them are doing video and that's been really, really um, impactful. But what we are doing here is quite unique because we, we are, we're going further than the video and we're now able to do diagnostics. That's really, really critical um, as a clinician because uh, two, two important reasons. Number one, um, we rely on a lot of data. So that's you know a patient's oxygen levels, listening to the patient's chest, all of those examinations that you've seen. We rely on that to enable us to make an accurate diagnosis. All right. The other thing is that um, the devices themselves <clears throat> and all of the data that we get enable us to risk stratify patients. So again, really important when it comes to COVID. So if you have a patient uh, who's got COVID symptoms or they're unwell in a care home, we then need to make a decision as to whether they are well enough to be managed in that care home be it antibiotics, any other treatments, or they're too unwell. In other words, they need to be taken to hospital. And the, all that clinical data that we gather from all those devices enable us to make those critically important decisions. Now, I've mentioned, we've obviously talked about care homes, but we, we are thinking far beyond COVID when it comes to these devices. As you can see, it can be used uh, for home visits. It can be used in schools. Um, we can set up remote clinics or hubs uh, or hospitals. It can also be used outside of healthcare uh, on oil rigs, platforms, uh, in cruise ships, uh, aeroplanes, as well as um, expeditions. So hopefully I've given you a, a taste of what we can do. Um, and I look forward to uh, getting some of those questions that you all hopefully have for me. I'll now hand you over to Leo. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Stephen, for your presentation and for an amazing job that you are doing. And just a reminder for our speakers, please try to limit your presentation to five uh, minutes. And uh, now let's hear from Emma Selby. Hello, Emma. How are you there? Hi, Ilya. You are right? I'm good, thank you. Please, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, so my name's Emma. I'm a mental health nurse here in the UK. So I'm based in Essex and I work with children and young people who are experiencing various levels of mental health concern. I'm going to jump straight in and share my slides with you uh, so that I can introduce you to our co colourful character, Embers. So I'll just share my screen now. Um, oh, it's not the right button. That's the right button. <laughs> Here we are. There we go. Aha. Uh, so Embers the Dragon initially came about as we started looking at the impact of mental health, uh, not just here in the UK, but globally. So mental health conditions in children have been on the rise for the last 10 years, and we've seen a massive increase in the impact that that's had uh, on a longitudinal scale. So for young children who don't get support in the early years, what that means for them as teenagers and then as adults. And this was all before COVID-19. So we were already seeing that actually there just wasn't enough mental health professionals to really scale and go around and be able to support young people and their families. What that looked like in practice was that one in eight children now experience a mental health problem. And that's 66% of primary school children. So that's children here in the UK, aged between about five and 12, experience anxiety. And that's following COVID-19. We know that there were 800,000 referrals for mental health support in the UK last year, but only one in four of those are accepted and the rest are not accepted into therapy because we don't have the capacity to support that many children. Early intervention really is key, not just as a result of COVID, but if we're going to avoid this tidal wave of mental health concerns that is coming and is getting worse as a result of COVID. 
So we started looking at what early intervention and prevention we could do. We know that if we support young children to learn emotional well-being and coping strategies earlier, they have a better outcome in terms of their mental health. In fact, for every pound that we spend in the early years, and by that we mean naught to about eight, uh, we can save 13 pounds in the long term. So we came up with Embers the Dragon. We took a digital approach because digital can scale in a way that me and my individual nurses can't. We took science of parenting intervention, which is universally considered the most effective intervention for mental health in young children. We took the entertainment of mainstream media, so any parent watching that's ever had to sit in front of children's cartoons knows that they can be very persuasive when it comes to children. So we took that, we put them together, and we created a platform that can take on any childhood development issue and turn it into an interactive episode with resources for parents and teachers to complete with children to help emotional resilience. So for the purpose of this trial, we created an episode specifically looking at helping children emotionally adapt to going back to school after the break from COVID-19. However, as a result of the success, we're already in production of episodes looking at anxiety, anger, self-esteem and bereavement. So I'll just quickly show you a trailer to Embers and his friend. You can watch the entire episode online for free at the website. Oh, no, that does on oh, the next slide. There we go. So we were really fortunate to have a huge amount of support from Innovate UK and actually from the wider community. So when we shared the first animation, the first episode, it was viewed all over the world. We had comments from India, Australia, New Zealand and Canada, as well as beyond. Uh, when I created this presentation, we'd reached 428,000 people, but we're now well over 500,000 people. And um, we have had amazing comments from parents and children who feel like they were really supported through watching the animation and then completing the worksheets and activities that go alongside it. We've had parents who say that they felt far more prepared to support their child's emotional health. As a result of the support we have from Innovate, we're already creating the next few episodes and are in early talks with Ladybird Books to create a uh, book production for those who are not able to access it on the internet. And we're looking at now expanding that into a global enterprise where we have uh, looking at physical activity, how we can support children's speech develop. We even had our first sample toys delivered this week after a very uh, interactive parent decided that there really should be an embers that can come home. So we're really looking forward to seeing where animation and children's mental health can go. So thank you very much for listening. I look forward to hearing any of your questions. Thank you. Thank you, Emma. Uh, such an inspiring and fun project. Uh, I, I'll definitely try it. <laughs> now let's move on to our next speaker, Julie Cummins. Hello, Julie. Hello, Elia. Hi, uh, greetings. Greetings will, from Scotland. Uh, the most important question for you is, will some of your goats join us today? <laughs> We've got Daphne, Daphne here, and this is Storm. Great. And there are a lot more outside. So please tell us about your project. Hi, well, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Julie Cummins and together with my husband and my daughter, we run Elkies Farm in the Scottish Highlands, uh, which is whiskey country as opposed to vodka country. Um, we host a monthly farmers market here on the farm. Um, and I just want to do a quick presentation just to show you and talk about how the COVID-19 problem affected us and how we tackled it and what we've learned from it. So I'm just going to share my screen with you. And hopefully we'll go straight into a share. Um, hopefully that will come up now and everybody will see it. So this is our farm on a normal market day. And we welcome farmers and producers from all over the local area to come and view our, view our farm and also to buy our products. It's connecting the community to the visiting public. We have low food miles, we've got local produce, 
so the community can come in, as you can see, the car park is very full. It's two hours, once a month. Lockdown came in March, as Neil has said, and this ended our markets and our on-farm dining events. Reflecting back, there were three stages to our approach to the crisis. Um, I've just lost my ability to go on to the next screen. There we go. Um, firstly, we had to react. All our commercial sales to restaurants, they disappeared overnight as the restaurants closed, so we got no markets and no future. So we had to get our little van out and we began distributing our own produce. We used social media to connect to all our customers and we contacted our market producers and started to offer to deliver their products to all the time this is adding great value to our business but driving around took time and we were very busy running the farm and by this time lambing and kidding had started in full flow and we'd got hundreds of babies everywhere but the demand and the feedback that we got reinforced the need that we had to do something innovative we had to change so we were already thinking about what might be possible when the government innovation scheme was announced but innovation takes time we had to have a considered response when lockdown started to ease and so we used best practice and sought advice and now created an outdoor market and environment. We started back up the markets in July and remarkably had an even bigger footfall than normal. We spoke to our customers, we conducted surveys to find out what they wanted and then we spoke to our producers to see if the customer's needs could be met. We'd noticed changes to buying patterns. There, people still wanted local products, better quality products, maybe even less quantity, but they disliked the new COVID conventional shopping methods. They wanted click and collect, they wanted time slots. So we had started to implement this. And in the top, you can see our new farm shop being built. So innovation, that was to deliver a long-term but future-proof solution. It had to be future-proof. A virtual farmer's market set in a new remote farm shop, which we saw being built. It's going to be unmanned, fully automated. You can pre-order online. You can um, come into the shop and buy your products direct from the locker. It's got contactless payment systems. All of the lockers are different size, so they can contain children frozen vending machine. And it's rebuilding the link between the producer and the customer. But now, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, it's their farmer's market. So the farmers and producers, again, gain a revenue screen, stream, but the community gets a safe, open all hours market. It's very easy to be socially distant. You can shop when you suit you. It's easy to be cleaned and maintained. There's minimal surfaces, very little contact points. From our perspective, it's web-based stock management. So we know what's in the locker, which lockers are empty. We can man that from our own shop and the office. And we can use our existing social media to market the plan. But critically, we can have a, a monitor in here so that the, the consumers can still meet the producer. We can still have meet the farmer, meet the producer. And there will also be a TV link direct into the animal sheds so that you can still meet the animals, which was quite critical on our survey. People wanted to still meet the animals. The virtual farmers market. Um, in summary, we know the drivers for change have always been there, um, but COVID was a catalyst for many businesses. And for us, it was the immediate change to buying patterns that we noticed. And a key benefit has been communicating with our customers and locals, really communicating with them. And instead of just selling them products, we've had to find out what they really want, what they want from us. Delightedly, they still want local um, and they still value meeting the producer. But there are challenges. Um, for a start, will the uh, Wi-Fi signal in the Highlands hold up to the technology? And how much time will we spend um, actually running the facility? How will we introduce and market new producers and products that we gain? And we know that all of this will evolve. Um, humans still need to communicate and interact with each other. We are only human. I'm just gonna stop the slide sharing now. Um, 
so we have we have a model that works. Uh, there's no IP in it. It's not location specific. Um, so we're quite happy to share that model with anyone anywhere um, and tell them how it's worked for us. Um, fundamentally, we're just eternally grateful to the UK government and to Neil and his team uh, for giving us this huge opportunity to to work with our community and to work with all the local farmers. And that's all I've got to say, Ilya. So over to you. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Julie. Visiting your farm is definitely on my wish list now. <laughs> We're delighted to see you. Great. Uh, our next guest comes from the world of theater. And please give your virtual applause to Toby Coffey. Hello, Toby. Welcome to the Different Ever After Festival. <laughs> Hello, and thank you very much for having me. It's uh, so incredible to be presenting alongside such a complete range of innovation um, and uh, seeing what other people in different industries are getting up to in the UK. And um, that word that you used there about catalyst for change is something that we talk about quite a lot as well. Um, uh, what I'd like to do now is uh, jump into my presentation uh, and is that okay, working okay for everybody? So yeah, I'm Toby Coffey, Head of Digital Development at the National Theatre in London, um, where the building itself houses three different uh, size theatres. Um, in terms of theatre as um, a, a discipline and um, a, a, a kind of uh, environment to be working in, it's really, really important um, that we recognize the need for innovation. And I wanted to just quickly touch on a couple uh, before moving into the one that we've most recently been uh, working on with the Innovate UK uh, financing. Um, over 10, just over 10 years ago, we launched National Theatre Live, which is where we started to broadcast our uh, theatre performances live from on stage to cinemas around the world. Um, it was highly regarded as a, as a, a kind of uh, genre changing kind of, um, initiative uh, it only came with innovation and uh, with a willingness to take a risk and to learn uh, from what we did um, we reached 10 million audiences in 10 years which was a, a, a feat and something that we were very proud of um, in terms of again going back to that word of uh, catalyst uh, and the kind of lockdown measures uh, and how industries respond to that uh, we launched national theatre at home which is where we uh, represented some of the broadcasts that had gone live to cinema um, across the internet uh, so people could watch at home in their living rooms and we reached an audience uh, of 10 million in actually 10 weeks whereas it had taken 10 years to the cinema um, audience so it was really clear to us that there's a very strong demand for entertainment of this kind to be taken to people's living rooms and to people's homes uh, and that is something that we actually need to take as uh, uh, an opportunity uh, moving forward and, and not to be COVID specific, I think. Um, I myself uh, set up the Immersive Storytelling Studio, which is an environment where we create uh, various forms of immersive work. Uh, quite typically, it might involve virtual reality or augmented reality, artificial intelligence, that kind of thing. Uh, and uh, the most recent project that we've had public facing from performative ex uh, uh, experience is a VR musical journey called All Kinds of Limbo. Um, and what this is, is we have volume, it's a theatrical performance that we invite audiences of up to 22 20 at a time to come to the, uh, originally to come to the theatre space and uh, put on a virtual reality headset. Once inside that headset, they're part of a communal virtual reality performance, and we've volumetrically scanned uh, the performer, Nubia Brandon, who stands in the centre there, and you can recognise your other audience members around you by these uh, kind of uh, beams of light. Uh, and it just reinforces that it's a communal experience, but also you can see where other people are, because we invite you to move around the space. Uh, and what this very much was, was the use of immersive technologies and the ceremony of live performance coming together to bring a new type of uh, immersive experience. But it very much felt like you were going to a performance 
uh, we relied on uh, people booking tickets. There was a show time. There was no late admission. Uh, and everybody started the experience all together. Also, when you put the headset on, you could hear the orchestra warming up. Uh, and even though this is a pre-recorded experience, it very much felt like you were going to see a performance rather than you were going to uh, watch a piece of virtual reality. Um, so as I say, it was originally uh, for up to 20 audience members, uh, and we showed this very specific room scale version at the National Theatre, at Sundance, and also at Tate Modern, uh, just before lockdown. Um, and uh, here you can see what happens generally at the end of a performance, is uh, people very readily adopt, even though they're in headsets, um, the mannerisms that they would have at a show. And when the performance ends, then we always see the audiences uh, in the headsets clapping to the virtual performer, uh, which is just a really nice uh, kind of indication that they're very much bought into this new type of performance. Uh, with, the <clears throat> uh, with the grant from Innovate UK, we're developing something called the Universal Performance Space. And what this does is it takes work like um, all kinds of limbo, but we're trying to create an environment that it will uh, disrupt the home performance market uh, and also quite significantly democratize the access to these new forms of entertainment. Uh, and so what we want to do is we will, uh, rather than create something purely for a headset based experience for those that have it, that actually the headset will be the most immersive experience, but we'll also create really rewarding experiences things like uh, uh, mobile augmented reality or virtual camera streams to TV. So the idea is that we can actually have one performance that's digitally staged that can broadcast out to many different formats all the way through uh, from VR, AR and to screen. But crucially, everybody is part of the same experience. Uh, and so what we are aiming towards uh, for next month <laughs> uh, is the, the first prototype of this uh, and uh, what we will see is um, the performance that was originally created to be see, uh, experienced in person at a venue actually what will happen it will be broadcast out and so you can see the images at the bottom if someone's got a VR headset at home they can see a kind of life version of the life-size version of the experience all around them uh, if people have uh, mobile phones or tablets they can be a tabletop type experience uh, and then uh, there's also a broadcast to TV as well. Um, this currently works with pre-recorded um, uh, performative material, uh, but the ambition, the bigger ambition is that we will be producing work with live performance as well. Uh, and the idea is that uh, in June next year, we will have uh, subject to further finance, the first public facing version of this. So we will be able to invite audiences uh, whether in London or Scotland or Moscow or elsewhere in Russia to uh, come and see all kinds of limbo uh, and the experience they have will be dependent on the type of technology they have so it won't be exclusively for VR it will be democratized across uh, different people's uh, means of accessing the work. Okay that is it for me and um, please do feel uh, free to get in touch if anybody would like uh, I'm looking forward to answering people's questions. Thank you very much, Ilya. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Toby, and thank you, everyone. We've seen very interesting and diverse projects today, and now it's time for a Q&A session, and we have approximately 20 minutes to do it. I personally have a lot of questions for all of our guests, but I encourage our viewers to participate in the discussion as well. And I guess uh, my first question is for Neil. Uh, Neil, do you personally use any products produced by the recipients of uh, your grant program? Uh, please turn your sound on. Is that better? Yes? Yeah. Yes. Yes, I do. I mean, bearing in mind um, these projects, th these innovations started in June. Um, some of them from a blank piece of paper. So, you know, obviously not of all of them are on the market, but yes, I do actually. Um, I have been, I, I have been viewing the National Theatre performances um, dur dur during lockdown and post lockdown. Um, I have viewed, I have listened to a, a virtual music um, 
from a, a, an organization known as the WOMAD Festival, who are doing a, a sort of surround sound music, world music um, system. Um, I have been, I will be buying some um, face masks, personal, personal protection face masks that have been developed by one of the projects. They're due to launch next month and will be available on Amazon. Um, and I think they're the only reusable, and I'll just look at my notes, the only reusable type two face mask on the market. So a type two face mask is, is, is one that um, can resist uh, the virus much more so than a sort of homemade material type one. So it's equivalent to, to, to some of these throwaway ones, but it's, it's reusable. And so it's actually technically it's a medical device. Um, so yeah, so I, I am using, I am using some and hope to use more of them in the future. Some Amazing. of them actually, I suppose, to be honest, some of them I hope I don't have to use, you know, <laughs> because they are for the current situation and what could develop in the future. So, you know, let's hope that some of the innovations are, we won't have to use. Yeah. Uh, and please remind me, what was the average uh, grant that you gave for this project? Um, it was a, probably the average was close to the maximum, which was 50,000 UK pounds sterling, which as I, Trend, I think is about 5 million rubles, if that's correct. Um, so yeah, the average grant was close to the maximum, I have to say, but that's to cover six months work, mm. you know. Gotcha. Uh, Stephen, we have a question for you from uh, the member of our audience. Uh, what are the plans for scaling up your products? Uh, and uh, is there a way for people outside of medical organizations to use them? And how do you plan to do it? Uh, thank you. Thank you for your question. So yes, uh, to, in simple terms, we definitely want to scale. So our plans at the moment in the UK is to provide these devices to uh, care homes. So we have just over 21,000 care homes here in the UK. And we have um, the privilege and we're partnering up with um, larger organizations like Intel who will be providing us with the uh, logistical and uh, technical support to enable us to, to scale up. Um, so at the moment, what, we've, what we have is several care homes who are utilizing the product. Um, and the plan is to spread this out to as many care homes as possible. In terms of um, use outside uh, of healthcare, um, absolutely, We're, we welcome uh, any sort of interests from people, you know, in industry who uh, feel this may be a, a useful product for them. Um, and we can have <clears throat> conversations over how best to do that. The, the sort of key USP we have as uh, clinicians first is that we know how best uh, these devices can be used um, by clinicians and, and patients alike. But, uh, do I need some medical education, some medical training to use your products? Uh, simple answer is no. So um, again, because of COVID, what we actually provide is um, a video instruction. So we send you a YouTube link. So if you're the uh, carer or the parent uh, who's utilizing this device, uh, you'll receive a YouTube link with instructions. And you know, it takes probably about five minutes of watching the video to familiarize yourself with the device. Uh, we also say to people that if you if you can use a you know smartphone any mobile phone then this device is really easy not as difficult at all great uh emma and my next question is to you there is a debate uh, among parents but not only parents on the proper amount of screen time for children what's your view on it and are there any correlation between screen time and mental health it's a really important question. It's something we had to think a lot about when we were creating Embers the Dragon because we didn't want to encourage more screen time. Uh, I think it is an important conversation to have because we do need to limit the amount of screen time that we allow young children uh, to have, particularly time spent online. And we do say that we don't recommend more than an hour of screen time for the age group, which is why we created the Embers episodes to be just normal entertainment episodes. So whereas you might have perhaps watched Peppa Pig in the past, uh, now you might watch Ember the Dragon, but all of the resources for parents, all of the activities and games that they can play, are all designed to be done not on a screen. So they're all downloaded and printed or 
uh, their creative game. So it encourages you to take screen time and turn it into an actual activity because we need to move uh, children away from only interacting with screens and starting to interact more with parents and other people in their social network, particularly as their social groups are a little bit smaller at the moment, because without that social interaction, they won't pick up on facial cues. They're not finding it as easy to pick up on emotions. And we've really seen that in the sort of four and five year olds going back to school. Yeah, we've really noticed the difference over this last month. Gotcha, thank you. Uh, Julie, let's talk business. What do you think is the reason that some businesses managed to survive the pandemic while others in the same industries did not? And what did the successful ones have that the others did not have? Oh, that's a challenging question. Um, I think it's, it's continuously looking outside the box. Um, you cannot assume in this world that your market will be there tomorrow or next week or the month after. So you've always got to have one eye on the future. And that could be just it's a changing product. It's a tweak to a product. Um, but it, it it is an ever changing thing. So I think that the biggest problem is businesses get comfortable. They stagnate. Um, and that should never be allowed to happen. Um, I suppose being being farmers, we're used to no, no two days are ever the same. Um, you know, animals will be fine one day and not the next day. So we're constantly looking to change and to evolve. And how could we do this differently? And we've applied that strategy to our farm business, along with our other businesses as well. Um, I'm not saying we're perfect, but maybe just looking outside the box more often. Yeah. Look around you, open your eyes and stop looking down. That's, that's great advice. Uh, Toby, what's your take on the future of theatre? And don't you afraid that technologies that you are developing and implementing right now could someday replace real life actors? Um, I, th I think uh, theatre has been around for a couple of thousand years uh, and has uh, at times faced that question uh, and you know whether it's what the technology is or what the you know when tv came around when cinema came around you know all these things are going to be the death of theatre um you know the 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 really uh, uh difficult part at the moment is uh, is the creative industries being able to make new work but what we are doing is creating and we're creating new forms of performance rather than forms that would replace existing ones uh, and we're looking at new ways in which we can take the work that does exist on our stages out to more and more people uh, and that is only going to increase uh, and uh, you know pretty much none of the new initiatives would exist if the work on stage was not still happening um, and so I think what we're doing is we're broadening the portfolio of ways in which audiences can engage in pieces of theatre rather than play, replacing one form of theatre with another. Uh, that's just not going to happen. Um, <clears throat> so in terms of the future, um, I hope that we will be um, having a, a greater number of opportunities for people to experience the National Theatre's work. Um, that might not initially be a um, going to the theatre, sitting in the auditorium and seeing a two hour play. It might be a communal music performance that people experience in VR um, and through that learn the magic of theatrical storytelling uh, that then leads them back into the theatre at some point. Or other people may keep uh, a more distanced relationship with the theatre purely attending uh, through cinema broadcasts. But that itself is okay and that's not going to stop the work on stage happening. Gotcha, I, I see. And if you could recommend just one immersive performance that everyone should see, what uh, would it be? Um, I think I probably have to say all kinds of limbo when you're available, when you have the opportunity is there for you to see it. <laughs> um, it's uh, the, the um, what is interesting in the area at the moment is there is, uh, the industry is evolving so quick. Uh, what you get is that immersed, particularly immersive performances, um, they stay for a relatively short period of time and then the artists move on to create the next piece of work. 
So unlike something like Warhorse, which, for example, has been on tour for 10 years, uh, we're yet to see those tentpole immersive productions that stay a huge duration like that. It's more actually uh, in, you know, we, we uh, did our first virtual reality performance uh, stage in the UK in January 2019, uh, and that was for a specific period of time. Um, and our remit is more to keep pushing the boundary rather than to keep restating the existing work. So in the current climate at the moment, with social distancing being what it is, uh, it's actually quite difficult for people to get to see immersive work, but hopefully that's going to change over the next three to four months and people will be able to get back out there. Gotcha, thank you. And uh, now I have a question for everyone. I think we'll start with Neil. Uh, do you think it's possible at all to prepare for a crisis? Based on your experience with the COVID-19, should we always have a crisis, strat crisis strategies in mind or is it worthless and we should just go with the flow? Well, I think, yeah, I think you should always have um, a view to what, what could happen in the future. I think, to be fair, predicting the enormous scale and speed of this pandemic or preparing for it, um, you know, it's, it's difficult to criticise really in retrospect. I know it seems to be one of those things, I think even when I was at school, people talked about future scenarios and a flu pandemic, about the, the massive effect it would have on the world. But speaking personally, I never really, you know, never really appreciated how it could be quite like this. Um, but I think you always, always need to prepare for the future. And I suppose from um, a personal work point of view in the organization I work with, I think, the speed that we managed to get this program going underway and some of the things we did a little differently with it to get it out quickly and to get the money out quickly to the innovations I think will be something that we'll keep for the future um, uh, you know whether it's Covid or something else I think we have learned lessons and how we can do things quicker and, and, and smarter perhaps. Uh, yeah that makes sense. Stephen what do you think do we need crisis plans? Yeah absolutely critical. Um, so if you look at you know, countries around the world that have been impacted by COVID, um, one of the main uh, concerns that we have in healthcare is, is, particularly with COVID, is the number of ITU beds that are occupied at any one time. Okay, so that, that has an, a particular impact in terms of the policies that obviously the, the, the government's uh, authorities will make, uh, which as you know, it will have an impact on the rest of the economy, et cetera, because then you're having to shut down restrictions, et cetera. So it's really, really important that we have plans. In fact, in healthcare, we do this all the time. You know, there are various crises. I mean, Neil mentioned Spanish flu that have occurred. There is no doubt that this is not the last pandemic that we may have to face. So it is really, really important that we, we, we do make plans. And I think technology is critical in that you know we've just i've given you just one example of how we can use technology to actually change and alter how we see patients and how we, we provide access to healthcare so it's really really important that we, we, we make those plans um and i wanted to say as well i i, I did hear that the sound uh, of the video didn't come up as well but it's it's available on youtube if anybody wants to have a look at you just type in uh, techie health uh, solutions um, consultation uh, that should come up as well. Great. Emma, what about you? Yeah, I mean, I agree with Neil that I don't think, you know, I don't think we can criticize the response that, you know, people have had to this pandemic because it was unprecedented. But as Stephen and Neil have both said, you know, we've had pandemics and we've had health crises in the past. And I think what would be foolhardy is not to learn from everything that we've experienced and everything that's grown from this pandemic. And for me, Part of that is looking at creating a, you know, communal resilience, not in terms of physical health, because we talk a lot about physical health uh, when it comes to pandemics, but actually we didn't study the mental health impact, particularly of SARS. We didn't look at how people being shut in their homes and not being able to attend the theatre or the loss of just shopping in an actual shop and seeing a person or, or wanting to still see the animals in their pens. Like, we didn't look at how important all of that was. And I think that we've learned a lot of that 
um, from the first sort of uh, round of outbreaks. And I think we were seeing that now as we move into second phases in a lot of countries. And I think being prepared to emotionally support generation after generation, uh, it would be foolhardy not to do that because otherwise we'll end up with an adult population that aren't right. Sure. Julie, what about you? Did, did, did you have a crisis plan before? Um, I don't think we have a crisis plan, but you're always crisis aware. Um, being farmers, we obviously do a health plan um, and we do health plans per species. So we have one for the goats, one for the sheep, one for the alpacas, and we revise that every single year. So about this time of the year, we sit down with the diary and we work out what the plan is for next year and what could go wrong, etc. cetera. Um, so I think it's being crisis aware. I, you know, I don't think anybody could have predicted this. We'd have laughed, we'd have laughed at them last year if anybody had said, this is what's gonna happen in 2020. We'd have just said, you know, you're off your rocker. Um, but I, I think we're always aware, it's at the back of your mind that something could, could go wrong. Um, and you just try to cover all thought processes and all exits. Um, how might you respond if this happened? Um, if that happened, how something else would happen? Um, certainly in my other industry as an accountant, you know, we're always looking ahead to the tax deadlines, which we know are well in advance. So you have to anticipate the workload, um, whether you've got staffing, you know, driving people to bring their books in, etc. So it is the same on a farm. Um, we're continuously trying to, to look ahead and you know, these animals are pregnant for five months um, or in the case of an alpaca, and I don't recommend anybody comes back as an alpaca because they're pregnant for about 11 and a half months. So we do have to look forward a long way. I'm not sure we would ever have the right solution, but we hopefully will have anticipated the problem or what might arise. So, yeah, I don't, think, I don't think anybody could have anticipated this year at all. Sure, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Uh, Toby, and what about crises in your field? Do you have any? Um, I think there's, I think there's two sides basically. Um, I think one, um, as Stephen, you know, very uh, clearly alluded to, the uh, message is this is the first of a number of pandemics that might come across a number of years, and therefore we can plan around that scenario. I think we've across all disciplines learned so much, and are you know i'm very much seeing a mood whereby we are looking long term rather than short term about how we adapt to lockdown measures uh, and how they may flex over time um so i think you know that, that this particular crisis has allowed us to plan uh, in moving forward for, for that type of scenario in able in the uh, to be able to plan more generally and have a crisis plan, we do have crisis plans for the known knowns, let's say, the, the, the things that we can see coming. Uh, but in order, and I think this has been very well demonstrated, in order for us to react uh, to a crisis that's an unknown known or, uh, sorry, an unknown unknown or something that we just didn't see coming, then innovation is the key word that allows an organization, an individual, an industry to adapt uh, and to come up with that new plan there and then in the moment. Uh, so for me, uh, you know, it comes back to the, the word that's central to this fund, which is innovation. Uh, and people have to be, that has to be kind of central to how people see their own discipline, their own business. Uh, and what that then allows you to do is not constantly reimagine but also it allows you to be very nimble when that huge hurdle appears from nowhere, all of a sudden, uh, you're adept at being able to respond quickly and in a way that makes sense. Great. Uh, one more question from the members of our audience, and strangely enough, it's also about planning. What were your plans for 2020 before the pandemic? And do you make any plans for the next year? Toby, let's start with you. With, with me, yeah? Yeah. <laughs> uh, so we were actually planning to take all kinds of limbo out on a physical tour, um, which very quickly uh, got shut down. That wasn't going to happen. 
um, and what we but what we have done is uh, you know we've created this new version um, that uh, will be able to be uh, kind of seen to audiences around the world, which is not something that we were intending to do. Uh, we've also created a very um, special uh, storytelling experience for young audiences where the, they themselves become the central characters uh, and they're delivered a story every day uh, to the parents' inbox and it has activities in the household. So it's a different type of immersive storytelling. It makes people's own homes um, the centre of immersion and the centre of storytelling. Um, in so. Again, that was not on the plan for this year. That came very much out of, of, of lockdown. Uh, in terms of planning for next year, um, the, the majority of plans at the moment are actually focusing around uh, the universal performance space um, and uh, how we take this new format and apply it to all the different types of projects that we were currently doing. So in a way, I guess it's seeing us centralize a little bit what might have previously been seen as a disparate set of types of performance. And in a way, it's a formalization of uh, what we're doing in a way that will make us more robust in the future um, and be able to reach more audiences. Also, hopefully a holiday at some point is on the front of the year. Yeah, that would be nice. Uh, Julie, what about you? What were your original plans for 2020? 2020 for us was um, lockdown came just as we were about to do a four day whiskey festival event where we got um, pre bookings for people to come in and doing farm tours and banquets in the barn and all sorts of things like that. Well, obviously that all stopped. Um, we would normally do a very big open day a number of times a year. Uh, where we can have up to 1500 people through the farm at any one time that's never going to happen this year is it going to happen next year probably not so how we adapted was to introduce little farm tours for our our bubbles as the uk um, has and they have been fantastic for us we have taken groups of six or eight around the farm that were a family group that up so um you know they didn't have to meet other people we've taken them around the farm on a little you know one-off tour just with their own and it has been fantastic we have loved doing it we have learned way more about our customers and our visitors than we'd ever learn if there were a farm tour of 30 or 40 people which we're taking around so that will definitely be happening next year um we'll perhaps be a little bit more organized at doing it next year though um it was very much done ad hoc this year we weren't set up livestock wise for doing it um, or root wise and we have learned from that um, and obviously our, our new machines we're looking forward to to developing those um, and just taking it forward really really getting to grips with talking to people again and I, I think we had possibly got into a little bit of a rut with um, selling selling what we felt the customer needed what we've had to do is talk to the customer again to go back to finding out is there anything different there's a lot been a lot more demand for ready meals but not the sort of ready meals that you can buy in the supermarket they actually want a home cooked ready meal prepared by one of our producers um, and that's been quite different you know they don't want anything fancy but they want home cooking food um, so in the, you know we're six miles from the nearest shop here um, 20 miles to the nearest town where we've got a supermarket there are no takeaways here for us so the idea that somebody could cook you know a fantastic cottage pie or something and put it in the the locker so that you can come in and actually I don't have to cook tonight I can have a, a home cooked ready meal from someone else that's that's as good as a takeaway for us so that's what we do we're changing we're changing that great uh, thank, thank you, thank you, Julie. What about you, Stephen? Yeah. So interestingly enough, we we actually were working on on our devices way before the pandemic. Um, so we, um, I, I don't want to say we anticipated it, but we were looking into the future in terms of you know how to make healthcare efficient anyway, um, and that was really our sort of primary focus. You know, so um, for example, with family doctors here in the UK often go out to do these sort of house calls or 
um, nursing home visits to see patients. And typically one of them can take an hour uh, or more just to see one patient. So we recognize that that was an issue prior to the pandemic. Um, you know, usually if you, you're a patient and you went to see the doctor in the, at the doctor's office, the doctor could see you within 10 minutes. So there was a huge sort of time saving opportunity um, for our technology. So we were looking at that. Um, but with COVID, what actually happened is it's propelled uh, the need for it even further. But also we were now able to see all the other benefits. So it was, it was, a, it was a plan of ours to, to obviously you know, bring this into the healthcare sector. Um, I think what we uh, were also looking at and what we intend to do in the future is really explore those other use cases that we talked about. So for example, in, in schools, you, you again recognize that there is an issue there when the child becomes well at school, you know, often the parent is called and then they have to pick up the child, they go home and then the parent then has to find an appointment to see the doctor. And all of that has an impact on the parent in terms of work, uh, on the child, especially in terms of school. But with our device, we will be providing this into schools so they will have immediate access to a clinician if the child becomes unwell. Um, and also we can actually provide COVID testing in schools uh, where they can get a result within an hour. Um, and that's part of our solution for schools. Um, we're also uh, looking at, I mentioned before, and utilizing it in the airline industry. Again, at the moment, if you're on a long haul flight and you become unwell, usually there's a telephone, so they pick up, you know, they'll ring a company in Seattle who might give advice over the phone. But now with our solution, those clinicians can actually examine the patient in real time uh, in the middle of a flight. So these are a number of opportunities that we are, are looking at exploring. Thank you. Uh, Emma, and what are your plans for this year? Um, COVID-19 quickly taught me that my plans mean nothing. Um, about two and a half weeks before uh, we went into lockdown, me and my partner, we pulled our kitchen out because we were doing an extension. So we did a tremendous four months of no kitchen. So I totally understand the appeal of decent microwave menu meals. Um, so yeah, so great space for us. Um, pandemic uh, and lockdown living, it basically just sped everything up. So we were already looking at doing embers. We'd already created uh, trial programs and testing because we knew that we had to do something different about children's mental health. Children's mental health was a massive issue before COVID hit, COVID just made it worse. But we also learned that actually there is so much goodwill behind children's mental health. So we were really fortunate uh, Joe Brand, who is a comedian here in the UK, Penelope Wilson, who is an actress here in the UK, and Doc Brown, who is a rapper, all gave us their voices for free um, and voiced some of the characters in the animation. It was just overwhelming, the amount of support we got. And I suppose moving forward now, the speed at which uh, the animation series is moving is quite mind-blowing to me as a nurse. Um, we're now getting the results back from the research and we're seeing that actually children who were scoring really low on their emotional development are scoring much higher through just three weeks of using an animation series. So I suppose for next year, it will be not letting that momentum drop. Um, we're already talking with Innovate UK uh, and other places about the next series of research and looking at how we really make the most of, of this time and these results that we've got and that we continue to do what we can to support children's mental health. Great. Neil, and what about you? Did this pandemic change your plans in any way? Well, it definitely changed my plans, but I think it's time for a John Lennon quote, actually, which is um, from, from a song of John Lennon called Beautiful Boy, which is, um, life is what happens to you while you're busy making other plans. Um, and so, you know, my other plans were fairly standard, um, you know, around vacations and children, going to school, I've got two teenage children and I plans for the future is that I, I think the future is very much a, as always with our children. So I, I do hope that for the year ahead, their education won't be disrupted any more than it has been. Um, my original working plans for this year is actually that I was working on a, a program around single use plastic and, and reducing the impact of plastic pollution, particularly in the oceans. Um, and when the, when the COVID pandemic hit, um, 
I, with uh, just two or three other colleagues, moved very quickly to try and get this programme started. I think for the year ahead, we're looking at what else we can do with these projects and uh, companies and uh, those participating today will know that we're, we're looking at how we can extend some of the funding um, in the short term, but I hope in the longer term too for the project. So I think in the foreseeable future, I'll be sticking with this program for a while. Um, sure. But yeah, for the future, I hope we all, we all recover. Great. Uh, thank you, Neil. And it's time for my last question for all of you. And I promise you it will be the easy one. What thing or what person inspire you the most to innovate? Neil, let's start with you. Oh, well, actually, uh, to, I, I can quote another, I can quote another famous British um, pop star at this point, <laughs> which is David Bowie. And uh, talking about innovators, um, I know it would be easy for me to say a scientist or a, you know, an engineer um, and quote from the Industrial Revolution or something, but actually David Bowie is, I think, probably one of our greatest innovative exports. Um, and again, a quote from David Bowie was that uh, tomorrow belongs to those who can hear it coming. And I think he was always great at predicting the future trends and, and, and adapting his music appropriately. So um, I say David Bowie was my great innovator. Great. Emma, and what inspires you? Um, for me, it would be my niece, Kira, who is uh, just turned eight, and my nephew, Josh, who is 10. Kira uh, has autism and Joshua uh, has nonverbal uh, dyspraxia. So he, both of them really struggled with their emotional development when they were starting school. And two of the characters in the animation are loosely based on them. Um, and they, to this day, remain the biggest fans of the series and just watching them giggle and laugh and follow the activities that was uh that'll always be the highlight for me wonderful toby um i think it's, it's, it's i don't know this is an easy question at all i think it's quite hard um but actually i think for me where i get most uh kind of inspiration in that way is actually being able to work with artists and storytellers and um, they always push us beyond the limits that we thought we could go uh, and and create fabulous new ideas. So I think for me, that's where the, the, the crux and the heft of the original thought comes in and that's, that's a very inspiring environment to work within. Uh, Stephen, what are your sources of inspiration? Yeah, I, uh, I have several sources, but probably the one that um, inspired me the most was uh, the, the French um, physician uh, by the name of René Lenec. Um, he was actually the inventor of the stethoscope uh, back in the 1700s. And um, I, read, <clears throat> I read an article uh, around the time when this invention came out and uh, they had written something really horrible and said, you know, this is a terrible device. It will never work. Uh, you know, horrible monstrosity, I think was the word that they described it. Um, and now, you know, you can't think of a, 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 a doctor who's been trained who has never used a stethoscope. So it's it's interesting that sometimes, you know, when you come up with something innovative, initially you, you you're met with a, a high degree of skepticism, particularly in the medical field. And then, sort of a few years later, suddenly everyone's using it. So I think that's something that inspires me to sort of push on on this journey. Great, Julie. Yeah, what a difficult question. Um, what inspires me? Um, we had one customer who, a very loyal customer, who was diagnosed with motor neurone disease and sadly died last year. And he climbed mountains and did all sorts of things. And he said, you need to never, ever give up on what you want. And plus of that, I have these. And I tell you what, whatever I think is going to happen in the day, these will tell me something different. And so you never ever give up on thinking what these might do and what tomorrow's adventures are gonna give you. Because it's not gonna be boring. I can tell you that it's one hell of a ride. Yeah, yeah, it is. Guys, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, it was my pleasure to learn from your experiences and to learn about your projects. Uh, thank you for joining us today and for uh, finding time to, tell our audience about what you do and what you what inspires you 
And I would also like to thank the UK Embassy in Moscow and Peer in Practice and of course the Innovate UK. Uh, thanks for our technical team and uh, for our, to, to our amazing translator. Thank you for joining us and participating in this discussion. Our next session will begin at 5.30 Moscow time today. We will discuss the research of the coronavirus genome. Stay tuned. Bye-bye. Back to you, Konstantin. Спасибо большое, Илья. Здесь уже я хочу поблагодарить от лица зрителей, конечно же, вас как модератора за потрясающую, интересную и очень жизнеутверждающую модерацию, потому что а, даже те вопросы, которые вы а, задали нашим спикерам в завершении, заставили меня задуматься, что же я как гуманитарий хотел бы видеть в своей жизни как таких основных персоналей а, для вдохновения. И вот, кстати, вы подвели как раз к теме нашей дискуссии. Она начнется в 17 часов 30 минут по Москве. По следам COVID-19 или зачем исследовать геном вируса? Мы расскажем о том, о чем буквально недавно могли рассказывать только научные фантасты. И те технологии, которые сейчас так сильно а, заставили научное сообщество искать методы избавления от этого вируса, в том числе могут помочь нам а, открыть уникальные грани науки. Науки, которую а, мы сейчас хотим назвать, это геномика наука, изучающая геномы и гены живых организмов. Если точнее, мы за, расскажем еще о программе, которая была запущена в Великобритании и объединила более 70 различных университетов и научных центров, правительственных учреждений, организаций и сферы здравоохранения. Но здесь все-таки будет профессиональный спикер, я не хотел бы у него забирать именно этот пласт интереснейшей информации, потому что действительно, по-моему, самый позитивный момент во всей этой истории с вирусом, то, что мы стали, мы имеем в виду обычные люди и люди, которые, может быть, действительно себя больше считают гуманитариями интересоваться именно наукой. Но, с другой стороны, еще есть одна тема, которая для нас супер актуальна. 19.00 по Москве будет еще одна сегодня в предпоследний день нашего онлайн-фестиваля дискуссия касательно работы журналистов во время пандемии. И мы догадываемся, что работа у них как минимум прибавилась. Более того, освещение экономических, политических и социальных процессов общества становится все более востребованным. И сейчас необычные изменения настигли и сферу журналистики. Об этом мы поговорим тоже сегодня в 19.00. В очередной раз слава благодарности всем нашим зрителям. До новых встреч, до скорой встречи. Еще раз, следующая беседа у нас состоится в 17 часов 30 минут.